good morning or afternoon wherever you are and welcome to this webinar organized by resilience first i'm robert hall the executive director of resilience first those of you who were unable to view the opening video resilience first mission is to help build resilience across business communities whether those communities be defined by geography or special interest please do visit our website resilience first .co.uk to see the many projects and events we organize in an effort to help our understanding and application of resilience. We have recently formed a strategic partnership with the Resilient Shift organization, so both our reach and output have expanded for the greater good. Today we are holding the third event in our webinar series on the way technology can help us to get to carbon net zero. We believe that there are four discrete places where greenery meets technology, namely adaptation, energy efficiency, renewables, and carbon capture or sequestration. We hope to shed some light on all these aspects during the upcoming series. We're delighted to partner with Intel on this ambitious project, which consists of one further webinar in March, and then a white paper on the same topic for publication in late May, ahead of COP26 in November. The theme of today's webinar is decarbonisation in the context of the manufacturing sector. In the session, we'll look at innovative technological solutions which could support the attainment of the climate change goals while ensuring that these new methods are both robust and safe, and at the same time helping to power the UK economy to new levels. The manage, manufacturing sector is often depicted as a major carbon emitter with heavy reliance on energy consumption and sizable transportation freight. According to the World Resources Institute, manufacturers in iron and steel, chemicals and petrochemicals, cement, make up the biggest slice of, emission, of the emissions pie in industry, 17% compared to 12% for the whole of the role of transport. Decarbonizing the economy will therefore be an enormous task and will be hugely disruptive, but failing to do so will result in a harsher climate and even greater risks for manufacturers. To help us on our journey today, I'm delighted to welcome five people who know a lot more than I and most on the opportunities ahead. Our keynote speaker has kind, kindly agreed to provide us with an overview of the role of manufacturers in this challenge while the two innovators will offer insights on, on some specific technologies that will help us on our journey to net zero. To lead us through the proceedings, I would like to introduce our chair for the session, Sahar Hassani, who is product manager at Intel Corporation, and has kindly got up at four o'clock in the morning as she's based in San Francisco to be with us this morning, so really grateful. Sahar will offer some opening remarks by way of scene setting and will then introduce the other speakers. Throughout the session, I encourage all listening to ask questions of the speakers by posting brief questions in the chat box to the right of your screen. I'm sure the chair will pick up as many of those questions as she can in the Q&A session in about 40 minutes time. Sahar, the virtual floor is yours and thank you. Thanks, Robert, and hello, everyone. Uh, as Robert mentioned, I'm Sahar Sani, uh, discrete manufacturing segment lead at industrial solution divisions of um, the IoT group at Intel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and chair the meeting with our partners and uh, have you um, expert and audience in this uh, forum. So I would like to start this session with the videos from Intel that shows Intel's commitment to sustainability and uh, the challenges that we've set for ourselves. Our world is facing challenges unlike any we have seen before. From devastating wildfires and the urgent need for action on climate change, 
to a deep digital divide and lack of representation and inclusion to the coronavirus pandemic that demands new thinking about global health challenges. At Intel, our strategy and goals for 2030 build on our ongoing commitment to corporate responsibility and reflect bold ambitions to overcome these global challenges. We invite all to rise with us to create a more responsible, inclusive, and sustainable future enabled by technology and our collective actions. Responsible. Drive to even higher standards of responsible business practices with the goal of revolutionizing health and safety with technology. Inclusive. Further advance diversity and inclusion with the goal to make technology fully inclusive and expand digital readiness for everyone. Sustainable. Continually invest in reducing our environmental footprint with the goal to achieve carbon neutral computing. Enabling all of these results through our technology and the expertise and passion of employees around the world. Over the next decade, we are committed to accelerating progress against the world's critical challenges together with the technology industry and society to enrich the lives of every person on Earth. Rise with us. You'll mute to her. Oh, thanks for letting me know. So as you can see, sustainability is one of the main goals and um, challenges that Intel has set for itself. But I would like to say that in the last uh, decade, uh, it has been, it, the last decade has seen remarkable revolutions in consumer industries because of major technological advances, intelligent mobile devices, cloud computing, and LTE networking have powered amazing innovations like Uber, DoorDash, and Airbnb, creating new markets for consumer and businesses across many vertical segments. Today, the manufacturing and energy industries are going through their own transformations. Manufacturing is moving towards more autonomous operations, which means generating, processing, and managing more data at the edge, all of which requires more compute and energy. Therefore, energy industry too is transforming, getting away from fossil fuels into renewables and clean sources of energy, all driven by a forecasted fourfold increase in energy demand and a clear societal push towards sustainability. More energy, less carbon. At Intel, while we continue to reduce our global manufacturing climate footprint, we will also take action with others to collectively expand the technology handprint transforming product energy use and design and applying technology to reduce computing related uh, climate impacts across the rest of the global economy including work with our pc manufacturing cust um, customers to create the most sustainable and energy efficient pcs on the planet help define new data center energy use and carbon reduction metrics with cloud service providers. Collaborate with industry and policy makers to apply technology to reduce emissions across high impact industries. At industrial solution divisions of the Intel IoT Group, we closely work with and across industries on sustainability opportunities where technology can play a significant role a few examples are grid modernization, energy resiliency, electrification of transportation, environmental monitoring. It's good to know of 169 UN Sustainable Development Goals, 103 are directly influenced by digital technologies. So the role of technology is obvious and inevitable.
in achieving sustainability goals. At Intel, we have big ambitions for ourselves as well as grow a growing sense of urgency to work with our customers and partners to address the challenges no one can tackle alone. With that, about Intel and our goal around achieving sustainability and the pos making positive impact to the industries, I like to go through the, um, through the sequence of this event that uh, Resilience First has hosted and helped to put together. We are going to start with Stephen uh, Phipson, uh, which is the, uh, who is the chief executive of uh, Make UK. Uh, he will be our keynote speaker today. After uh, Stephen, Mehal Shah, uh, business head of TCS Clever Energy, is going to go through a presentation as part of the innovation presentations that we have in this event. And then we will have Richard Simmons, chief technologies for data analytics of Logicalis, is going to go through his pres innovation presentation. After that, we are going to have a Q&A session with all the speakers and Intel's special guest, Ricky Watts, who is Senior Director of Industrial Segments of the IoT, um, Intel IoT Group. With that, um, let me uh, introduce you to Mr. Stephen Phipson, uh, which is keynote speaker. Thank you, Zaha, and um, good morning, everyone, and it's great to be with you. Um, let me start off by um, talking a little bit about my organization, so um, you know who's, uh, who's speaking to you today. So Make UK is the national organization for manufacturers, and of the 2.7 million people that we have in manufacturing in the UK, through our members, we represent about a million of those, of those employees. And as a representative body for manufacturing, our my real key objective here is to do all we can to raise the importance of the sector and obviously ensure the right environment is created to ensure manufacturing not only thrives and grows, but is also a key contributor to the decarbonisation agenda. That's become very important over the last 12 months in particular. I'm very proud of British manufacturing, the way in which we've adapted and innovated to create a dynamic, highly skilled and world renowned sector a sector that is increasingly high tech and green. And we know that manufacturing is vital to our economy. It represents 53% of UK's total exports, around 10% of the gross domestic product, and around 65% of all the R&D that's invested in the UK. So really important. So let's think about decarbonisation and the role of manufacturing technology in this important agenda. Let's think about, first of all, the operations of manufacturing themselves in the country. And there is no denying that manufacturing, as we've just heard, is a major carbon emitter at the moment. It makes up in total in the UK about 12% of the total emissions. The manufacturing sector is composed of a wide number of subsectors, many of which are energy intensive, which means for this debate that the cost of energy represents around 20% of their overall costs. Aside from this, all manufacturing facilities have got boilers, conveyor belts, compressors, turbines, pumps, machine tools, all of which in some way or other, either directly or indirectly, burn fossil fuels and then consume, obviously, electricity. It is a fact that a very significant proportion of energy waste comes from old, leaking, inefficient equipment, compressors and pumps in these factories, and that most of the heat produced by the machinery is not recycled at the moment, it's wasted. We in the UK certainly have tended to sweat existing assets. That's certainly been a, a management approach rather than investing in generally the latest technology to the same extent that we've seen other countries do that. So the manufacturing industry is indeed reliant on energy to function normally. And this is inherent in any production of goods, just as we're all here, all are and always will be reliant on energy to heat our buildings, for example, or to move around. Products and goods are made with raw materials and components that need to first reach manufacturing facilities to be produced and ultimately to reach their customer's destination, whether that's domestic or international. So it's not really a question of whether freight transportation, road or shipping 
is needed or not. But again, what type of fuels and power mechanisms are used for these types of transport modes? And at the moment, they absolutely rely on fossil fuels. Shipping, for example, only makes up 3% of the emissions, but it's one of the most difficult to decarbonize industries. So our reliance on energy cannot and will not change, but what will change is which type of energy we use, fossil fuels or renewables. On that note, we welcome the very recent launch of the Clean Maritime De Demonstration Competition, and we'll be following with interest the work of the Jet Zero Council, in which we have a number of our members participating, which is all around sustainable aviation fuel, zero emission aviation and aerospace technologies. It makes complete sense for UK manufacturers to integrate now net zero into their strategies to build in a resilient and sustainable future. Manufacturers are, however, agile and maintain the ability to manufacture the products that our economy needs at any time. It's part of the sector's resilience that's really been highlighted recently during the COVID-19 challenge. Government policy and the investments and tax regimes in particular will also play a key role in the speed of the transition to alternative net zero energy. So in terms of the role of technology, we're also in the manufacturing sector at the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. Industrial, te industri industrial digital technologies will play a central role in improving manufacturing efficiency, reducing waste and optimizing freight flows, and therefore is a key enabler to the move towards sustainable manufacturing. As I said before, the manufacturing sector is very diverse in the UK. It plays host to some of the largest manufacturers who are great technology adopters and world leaders in innovation. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have many SMEs. In fact, 95% of the companies in the sector in the UK are in the SME category, and which many of these are still not really adopting some of these new digital technologies at speed, even though they do acknowledge that the, there are significant benefits in doing so. If we do not support them to overcome these barriers, we risk creating a bit of bigger productivity gap between those firms that are adopting technology and those that are not doing anything at the moment. Our recent research showed that 71% of manufacturers in the UK are planning to increase spending on industrial digital technologies in the next two years and two-fifths of manufacturers are planning to invest in green technologies. It's vital that such plans really do translate into action as time is short. Not only would this me measure spur much needed investment in capital expenditure in the immediate term, but in the mid to longer term, it would support the government and industry's efforts in achieving net zero and positioning the UK as a leader in digital manufacturing. Digital infrastructure underpins the economic, cultural and social infrastructures to develop places where people want to live, work and visit. For businesses, this is absolutely crucial to, to more productive economic activity. This is why 69% of manufacturers recently said to us that they plan on investing in their digital infrastructure in the next 12 months. As a result, 41% of manufacturers said the government should prioritise digital connectivity in towns and rural areas to unlock, unlock that productivity, but crucially drive greater innovation and carbon efficiency in their businesses. The national rollout of 5G and ultra-fast broadband must really happen in this country in the next two years. The success of local economies depends on all our businesses using the best digital technology and data to drive that innovation, resilience and productivity. Better digital infrastructure can support manufacturers become more productive and competitive. Moreover, without the basics such as 5G, full digital adoption will be out of reach for many of these smaller companies. Taking these what may appear simple steps, I think, would have a huge impact on manufacturers across the UK in their efforts to get on that journey of decarbonisation. But also, as, long, as well as the operations and the manufacturers themselves, it's important to consider the role of research and development and new net zero technologies, some of which we'll hear a bit, bit more about today. In order for technology to play a prominent role in decarbonisation, a greater focus has to be placed on innovation and especially research and development. It is concerning that COVID 
at the moment in our, in our surveys will lead to reduced spending on R&D in the next two years. This will have knock-on impacts for future years. We need to see significant uplift in private sector R&D spend that is needed to deliver the government's 2.4% GDP target. Government must improve the effectiveness of the R&D tax credit scheme by simplifying the application process, speeding up payment, as well as doubling the R&D tax credit expenditure. It is good, however, that a £375 million fund has been announced in the recent budget to help scale up the most innovative R&D intensive businesses. However, help should not just go to the most innovative projects and not just to the R&D projects. It needs to be recognised that already established installations, which are not necessarily conducting R&D projects, but simply changing to a more energy efficient and to an electricity powered environment in advance of the normal equipment's end of life date, are a key part of the manufacturing sector's contribution to net zero. This would lay the foundations that this country needs to ensure we are the creators and makers of the future and in the best position to be world leaders in green technology. Despite the COVID-19 crisis, manufacturers have grasped that the green industrial revolution is one of the major opportunities, if not in many cases, the only one at the moment, to rebound from the pandemic and to build a future resilient economy. While they are rethinking their business, their business models post-COVID, and we have new challenges like the new arrangements with, um, with the EU to negotiate and the new global trade opportunities. It makes complete sense for our manufacturers to integrate net zero into their strategies going forward and to build in a resilient and sustainable future. They know they have a pivotal role, not so much because of they will, of course, have to decarbonize, but most importantly, because they will be the ones producing the next generation of goods, providing the services and adopting the agile business models needed to transition to a low carbon economy. The pace of product development on new green tech is high at the moment. Hydrogen fuel cells, expansion of offshore wind, carbon capture usage and storage, and electric vehicle production are just some of the higher profile examples that we see in the press, but there's a lot more behind that. However, manufacturing is a very complex web of supply chains. And in order for these new technologies to go into full scale production in this country, we must support the supply chains to make the transition. An example of this is electric vehicles, where we hear much talk about battery production in the UK and the government supporting efforts such as gigafactories. However, there are a whole suite of other complex components which are needed to produce an electric vehicle. The question here is how do we transition existing suppliers who manufacture at the moment internal combustion engines or gearboxes to make these new generation components. And for that, we need a long-term industrial policy. So what are we doing as an organization, as a business representative organization? We've been keen to guide and help members um, towards the net zero challenge. And it's become one of the long-term top priorities on the agenda of us and many of our larger members. We've been busy setting up a, a new net zero framework with a set of net zero guiding principles and a toolbox with resources to enable them to get started or accelerate their pace and a series of demystifying net zero educational workshops. In addition, we'll be working on ambitious sectoral roadmaps, setting out how to meet the target within the manufacturing sector. We will, of course, be liaising with other subsectors who have already got some plans in place and building on theirs to ensure there is a level of national coherence. We're also supporting the UK's official promotion campaign at COP26, the Race to Zero, by encouraging our SMEs to sign up to the SME Climate Hub. From a technology perspective, we are engaging with our membership around various thought leadership pieces and looking to identify key barriers around the adoption and implementation of digital solutions across the sector. This, of course, includes the critical issue of retaining our workforce, retraining them, and having the right skills available. This complements our work around the net zero challenge. On COP26, Make UK intend to have a strong presence at the COP26 conference this year. This will showcase our manufacturing members during a dedicated manufacturing session to demonstrate the pace and ambition of the sector's transition to a sustainable economy. 
It will highlight that manufacturers play a crucial part in helping everyone achieving net zero through the development and application of world leading technology, services and business models to lead the green revolution. So in conclusion, over the course of the last year, manufacturers have been incredibly flexible in trying to help the country in the national interest by repurposing or increasing their production of essential equipment, products and services. But no one should forget, despite these difficult times about the long term future, and this means continuing on our journey towards sustainability and becoming a net zero economy. As industry looks to rebuild and grow after the pandemic, we will work with businesses to refocus on their sustainability goals and deliver a green recovery built on the foundations of innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for the great talk. With that, I'm going to um, pass the uh, stage to Mehal Shah, who is the business head of TCS Clever Energy. Mehal, please. Thanks, Har. And let me share my screen. Perfect. Thanks and uh, good morning to uh, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, my screen is visible and I'm audible as well. Just checking, uh, Richard or Sar, if you can confirm that. Yes, can, can we see it? Great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, once again, so uh, myself, Mihil Shah, and uh, as Sar mentioned, I had energy management business for Tata Consultancy Services uh, globally. So today our intent over here is uh, we'll see we as in uh, as a TCS also looks uh, at uh, various aspects in terms of how we can make the organizations more purpose driven and make them more resilient towards uh, the impact of uh, the organizations which they can positively contribute towards the environment for which we had a, a very uh, unique and a different way to approach in terms of uh, uh, at foreign organizations as an enterprise level, how we can help them by a solutions uniquely designed, uh, which can help them not only to meet their carbon neutrality or reduces their emissions, but also making, making them more energy and cost efficient. With that, what the organizations can get is obviously help them to amplify their financials and sustainability goals by driving more effectively more or, or more efficiencies than trying to uh, go beyond and try to put a lot of capex in terms of driving the uh, efficiency or uh, emission reductions. So with that, how we approach this particular space in a quite different way, because why we believe that the energy consumption should matter to both business as well as to environment, because obviously first and foremost for every organization, it is important that if they manage their direct emission, which is happening because of under their scope one and scope two uh, emissions because of their uh, purchased energy, how we can bring the reduction in our emissions by efficiency uh, and making them help them to shift towards carbon neutrality, because that is very critical and very difficult part to do it, because obviously there is a shortages of the renewable sources of the energies globally. And in that type of scenarios, how it is important for an organization to be more responsible and drive uh, obviously the energy efficiencies and reduce their emissions. But more importantly, when you try to do that, what you also get is your reduction in your cost, which is another primary thing in the given time where your operating costs are going high, how we can not only help you to reduce your emissions, but also to bring down your cost. And particularly in the manufacturing space where you have to dealt with a different uh, vendor ecosystems or in terms of connecting to the different source of data could be your PLC systems, SCADA systems, MES systems, the LIMS systems, or even in that matters, your flow meter, your steam meters, how you can connect to those type of different uh, uh, solutions and the systems and collect the data and try to drive the reliability of your critical assets and equipment, but more importantly, getting you an agility and visibility so that you can drive certain decisions on a real-time basis and take those actions to avoid the vestiges of energies which is happening across your value chain and providing you real-time uh, insights, but leveraging the cognitiveness of the technology. And that is where in such type of scenarios, the technologies like cloud, artificial intelligence, edge and machine learnings helps to bring those type of or use those 
cognitiveness and drive the energy efficiencies and bring down your cost as well as your emissions. So this is how we see from the six dimensions point of view that how the solutions like uh, the Clever Energy can create an impact. And in order to bring that complete covering the value, what we also do is that we have two variants in terms of our energy management, which typically helps foreign organizations to optimize their different types of uh, facilities and different types of assets, which is important because once uh, what we do is that you have your utilities uh, within your commercial buildings, you have your utilities within your manufacturing plants, and that is where the, the clever energy variant of uh, building plays a critical role, which helps to optimize the electricity, gas and water uh, utilization and consumptions for your utilities like your HVAC systems, your boilers, air compressors, um, uh, which are more and more in utilities for, for a shop floor. But more importantly, the majority of the consumptions for a manufacturer also happens within their manufacturing lines. And that is where we built up our second variant, which we call it as an industrial energy management, which is acronymed as VEGES which takes care of all the source of energies, include water, air, gas, electricity, and help to optimize your manufacturing process from an energy man energy point of view and bring down your energy consumptions because that is where your major emission and consumption is happening uh, in your complete value chain. And that is where we industrialize those type of con concept of artificial intelligence and machine learning digital twins, which helps us to optimize those facilities at a scale in the manufacturing space and because of which even the IoT Global uh, Award has recognized these solutions for these years of industrializing the AI ML uh, uh, for the industrial customers under the big data cloud and analytics category. But more importantly, when you see what is required in terms of driving that, what you need primarily is the four key capability where you need a very vendor agnostic capability to collect the data. Uh, obviously, by connecting to those assets, talking to different uh, OT protocols, talking to different IT protocols. So you need that agnostic way of communicating to those type of systems and then helps you to get the real time data which can be analyzed and it can be used effectively in terms of not only to try to drive certain alerting or alarming capability, but also going beyond and use the artificial intelligence, machine learnings and the analytical concepts, the digital twins to do your golden batch predictions and effectively manage your metrics, your key performance indicators quite effectively by getting you the recommendations and the insights almost on a real time basis. And that is where you can use the technologies like IoT, uh, which we, we also built an IoT platform called TCS Connected Universe platform, which helps us to manage the data at scale, but more importantly, create the value using this uh, technology enablement. Uh, obviously, how do we see that in the industrial space? Where do we see the opportunity and how do we approach? So typically, the industry has seen the way of trying to drive the energy uh, management through a a uh, capex based approach what we wanted to do is to drive the energy by an opex based approach where we use the data leverage the existing infrastructure and then try to drive the energy optimization and the carbon emission reductions by creating an integrated energy view of connecting all your plants on the solutions and doing a demand versus supply correlations and giving you an ability to drill down at the facility level at the asset level and, and do the energy balance and track the kpi but more importantly, when we go beyond that at your process level, how we can generate the process insights by learning from your historical behavior and recommend to the operators on a real time basis to what kind of actions and an optimum route for them to manufacture the same quality without impacting the quality or quantity, how they can generate uh, those uh, effect or they, without impacting the quality, how they can optimize their energy consumptions. And beyond oh, that- Thank you, please bring to a close. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, with that, what we do is that obviously we try to bring down the asset energy performance optimizations through our digital twins and leverage our tariff management, benchmarking and baselining capability and do a comprehensive carbon management. And what you see it over here is that on the maturity journey of, uh, of the energy management, this is what the efficiency can be driven from a cost and carbon point of view to the scale of 12 to 15 percent uh, energy year on year reductions is can something can be obtained through the uh, leveraging the cognitive technologies. So with that, uh, yeah, Richard, I'll, I'll take a pause here and I hand it over back to Shah. Thank you thank very you. much. Can you take down your slides, please, Mahal? Thank you. Yes.
with that, we are going to uh, have Richard Simmons, Chief Technologist at um, Logical, uh, to present uh, his topic. Thanks, Al. Uh, Right. So good morning, everyone. So firstly, thank you uh, very much. It's great to be here today um, to be be talking to you all um, around the role of technology. Um, I think just to give you a little bit of background um, for, for myself and um, for, for Logicalis, because I'm sure um, a lot of you probably haven't heard of us. Um, we're, we're a global a global business um, and we're focusing in a number of um, sectors, but to really try and drive the adoption of digital technology. So to help our customers to transform the way their business are operating using the, the digital technologies that are out there. Um, and to, I, I think probably most important is to help them to try and make make real. I think there's a lot of things that we can talk about and in manufacturing, we can talk about um, things like industry 4.0, digital factories. Um, and I think it's relatively easy to, I think most people would be um, supportive of what that could potentially achieve in the same way I think most of our customers we engage with have, certainly have a desire to want to drive decarbonization. But I think it's really our role is to try and help them to make that real. Um, so we do that in a, in a couple of ways. Um, we, we obviously we have a, a strong background from, a, from an IT perspective where we're helping to build some of those foundations. Um, so whether that's things like cloud security, uh integrated networks between things like ot the operational environments and the it environments um but what we also do is we focus on uh vertical solutions too where we may be partnering with um more vertical specific uh partners as well to drive solutions in those areas and to help us to do that we have our own platform called eugenio which allows us to provide a lot of this uh, technology as a service um and today, all I'd like to do is to talk through just a couple of areas where we're focusing and where we're working on with manufacturing. So the first of those is something we call operational insight. And actually, with this, I think um, Mahal has already uh, uh, talked through, I think, uh, some of the principles that sit behind this, too. So we certainly see in, in for a lot of our customers gaining visibility of what's happening within the environment already, I think, is really important important. Um, and there's a number of different stages of maturity in doing that. So just simply getting a visibility of, of what, what your environment looks like as a snapshot in terms of both from an operational sense, from an IT sense, from bringing together things like the buildings, the building management systems, as well as your what might be running in the manufacturing plant, as well as what might be running within kind of the data center and, and, and also what's happening with your people. Um, bringing that together into a single view can add a lot of benefits. And you can certainly identify a number of different areas where there can be cost savings as far as your energy efficiency is concerned. Um, but we shouldn't underestimate the fact there are some challenges to doing that as well. So what we do find is when we go and talk to our customers, the majority of them will already be generating information around what a lot of the systems are. And certainly if you go and look on a lot of the manufacturing plants, depending on how new um, they will be or when they've last been refreshed, there can potentially be a huge amount of data being generated in these environments. But what tends to happen is they're relatively siloed. So the information is being used in its own local context to try and just improve that area. So the first thing we're doing is helping to connect together these environments to bring together to get a single view and help set a benchmark of what good looks like. So you can identify if one machine is running at a, you know, is perhaps being less um, less efficient than another when it shouldn't be very simple you can then start leveraging um things like um ai so machine learning to start then building thresholds to start underlining patterns of behavior and start triggering alerts so you can be more proactive on making sure that those machines those environments are becoming more efficient in terms of the way they're consuming and then moving that forward you can then start looking to automate that um a lot more so this is where the concepts of digital twin come in, where we can then provide that to again and bring a real time view. And at this point, you're not actually you're trying to get the environments to self tune so you can make them as efficient as possible. But with all of this going through these steps, what you're looking to do is to try and reduce as much as possible the energy consumption that you're driving within these environments. So I think it's one thing to capture where your um, you know where the you know the emissions are coming from to capture where your energy where your energy is being spent this is trying to understand where that energy is going and to make sure that you're being as efficient as you can 
But it does mean you have to overcome some challenges that we engage with around both integration, security, being able to scale this up. It's one thing to get some information on one machine. It's another if you want to run it across multiple factories um, in real time. And then one of the other things we find is bringing the business together. So there is some key sponsorship between both the OT, the operational environments, where there are particular concerns about uptime, making sure these environments are always running because the business depends on it. Um, and then obviously bringing in how you then get data out of those environments without impacting or causing risk. So bringing those teams together and create sponsorship. Now, we find this can generate some value. It can certainly help businesses get a greater visibility of how uh, efficient their businesses are. And one of the things we then started thinking about is whether we could then bring that kind of approach to helping businesses with so putting in place their decarbonization initiatives. So we have uh, built out a platform called Block C, which is, as you may guess, is based on blockchain. But the idea behind this is to bring the same kind of visibility and management that we would be doing within an operational environment, but to the way that you are managing your decarbonization and your um, your sustainability initiative. So it has four uh, key components to it. We have an inventory element. So we have a single interface where everybody can consolidate, calculate and track your emissions into the blockchain. So it means that the data, once it's in there, it's trusted, it's visible, and obviously it can't be changed. So you're getting this single repository of information, but it's also making it a lot easier for everybody to be able to input into it. And one of the things that makes this particularly important is it's relatively easier to be able to identify your own emissions within your own business. But if you want to then push that out to cover your ecosystem and into your value chain and your supply chain, there could be, you know, several to dozens to, you know, multiple other organizations that you need to engage with to try and set that around. So within this platform, it gives you the ability to extend to them, to be able to set targets with them, to give them an interface, which they have to input into so that you're getting into a single place, all of the information you need to track their emissions, but also track their progress. It then has an, an audit um, module. So again, in order to then to make it easy for you to produce a reporting on the annual basis, it's aligned to uh, a number of the organizations that would provide this kind of auditing to allow you to then easily produce a report to kind of show what your carbon footprint is, but to do it in a way to make it easy as possible to, to publish those out. The third part of it, which I think is, is obviously important is to then enable you to get sourcing for carbon offset projects so that you can then start looking to leverage those so that you can neutralize your emissions. So it's giving you some control of you understand what your carbon footprint is, but then you're able to offset that against a number of different projects that are within the within the tool so that you can manage it towards getting to that net zero target. And then the final element of it is we often see with a lot of our customers that there is definitely a desire to set targets, but often those targets aren't necessarily science-based. So working with people like the Science-Based Targets, which is a, as an organization, we've built into it, again, a module which is helping to take all of the information around, um, obviously, the climate and the kind of targets that need to be set to be able to allow you to set goals and targets that are going to be aligning with the science. So all this is doing is allowing you to validate that the work you are doing is then being um, being aligned to the work that people like the Science-Based Targets and um, the World Bank are doing to show that it's supporting initiatives, obviously, like through the Paris Agreement. Um, to give you an example, um, one of the customers that we've worked with this on is actually Microsoft. Microsoft, obviously, you think of as being a, a software provider, but clearly they're a huge manufacturer of, of hardware as well. So we were able to establish science-based targets with them. Um, we can allocate percentages of that to their value chain. And when you start looking at it, there's a, there's a whole... Um, host of different kind of suppliers that they would be providing. So electricity would clearly be one simple one, but then in terms of data centers and backup, yes, it's you're generating power, but it's also generating clearly fuel for the, the, the diesels for the generators, um, and then all other kinds of suppliers. So who they're using for, whether it's for travel, for um, for likes of Uber or, or British Airways. So we were then able through the platform to track the emissions reductions achieved during the year and to their commitment periods and then able to produce a carbon budget for the companies and suppliers. So for those of our customers where they're wanting to extend out what they're doing, not just for what they're doing within their business, but to their ecosystem, it's allowing you to have that kind of visibility and control of what you're doing and how you are looking to manage it. Um, the final thing then, all I was just going to add is this is that, I mean, I'm sure most of you are aware, but it, if you want to look a little bit more around things like the science-based targets, I've kind of linked there, they've just produced their progress report for 2020. There are a number of, um, you know, uh, customers within the sector, you know, in case, like the Agio, um, 
Unilever um, are, uh, you know, already uh, signed up. Um, but there's some more information there and their progress report is really interesting. And obviously the state and trends of the carbon market, it's interesting to see again, the number of different kind of pricing initiatives that are continually beginning to grow um, and the different kind of um, uh, uh, funding that's coming across around those pricing revenues. So there's a little bit more of, of reading there that hopefully will be of use to you. So thank you to that. I said from our side, I think they, you know, we, we understand that going back to, to Robert's point at the beginning, our focus is, is really around trying to drive to do things to get visibility on the energy efficiency of what you're doing to provide that kind of baseline for what you're at. That then can help support into um, all the other initiatives that you're then looking to drive and then leveraging block C to help you manage that decarbonisation initiative in a structured way so that you can scale it out in a confident um, and managed way so that it is not becoming uh, an overhead and drain on your business, but become something that's enabling you to genuinely transform what you're doing. So thank you very much. I hope that was useful. That was great, Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I would like to invite all the speakers to please join the panel. Uh, we've got a few questions from the audience that I would like to review and uh, get response from the team. I start with uh, the question from Michael Rooney. Uh, he's asking, what are manufacturers' greatest challenges in meeting zero carbon? Richard, Meha, Ricky, if any of you have a response, please go ahead. I'm, I'm more than happy to. I will jump in if that's all right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I would say the first thing is the challenge around it is it's, it would be two things. One is it can be complex. There's a lot of different areas that can input into this. So obviously it's having a plan that is going to enable you to um, to progress on a number of different areas. And we've kind of touched on some of those already today. Um, you know, is whether it's looking at the way that you're getting the, you know, the, the energy, whether it's using trying to move towards different types of fuels, um, upgrading the machinery, all of these things can have an input, but obviously it can, um, there is a complexity to that. And I think underpinning it is all of the businesses need to be able to continue to operate and to work. So in a lot of areas, especially in manufacturing, while there may be a desire to do this, it is making sure that you can try and align the investments that you've got in terms of the spending you've got to move towards this in a consistent way. It's probably not realistic to be able to go and say, we're just going to go and start again with the most efficient green um, factory. These have got assets that could be there for a number of years. So I think it is that blend of, of kind of setting a target and a vision of where you want to get to, but then how you work through that, making sure you're making investments in the right way, keeping visibility of what you're doing so that you can move towards that target in a structured way. Very good, thank you. Anything to add, Mahal? Yeah, I know, I think uh, it's pretty much what Richard covered, but typically I also see that in the industry, there is a challenge in terms of measuring and collecting so much of data in terms of uh, understanding how the emissions, what are the areas where the emissions are happening. And that is where uh, the technologies like uh, Stephen mentioned and Richard mentioned that the digital technology, digitalizing those is critical and the accuracy of it. And that is where the science-based targets are, are playing a critical role. The accuracy at which you report the data is also plays a critical role because that is what your commitments are getting measured against. So these are the, the additions to those two things which I see uh, across the industry, particularly the manufacturing space are a typical challenge in terms of driving the decarbonizations or uh, reducing their emissions. Thank you, no, that makes sense. And I think Ricky, we hear th about the same thing from our customers. Do you want to add a few words here? Yeah, no, I, I Richard and, and everybody said it really well. I, I mean, you talk about challenges, you know, manufacturing, you know, is using technology that was developed predominantly a very long time ago. Um, you know, it's been optimized, it's been worked on over many years, you know, in terms of what it does today, in terms of the manufacturing environments. Changing that technology, in my mind, is extremely difficult and highly risky. So, you know, so even when you talk about decarbonization and these things, I think everybody, every manufacturer that I've spoken to across the planet wants to do this, but they've got to do it in a way that makes sense for their business. I think Richard captured that quite well, you know, and there's a challenge in doing that. It means that their suppliers that are supplying the, you know, the infrastructure that goes into the factory has got to change as well. 
So it's not just the manufacturers, the whole industry has got to change from end to end. You know, the manufacturers, the suppliers of the control systems. You talked about federated learning and learning, of course, you know, taking data from the factory and using that to optimize how you run that factory impacts your climate impact from that factory. That's great, that's one thing. But to truly, really release that, you've got to connect it to the control systems in an intelligent way. And that at the moment is a manual process. You know, we, you know, we in Intel we call this IT to OT type of impact. You know, crossing the chasm as I call it into OT technologies and truly unleashing the power of what data will actually tell you in terms of optimization of factory is the next challenge. And again, I, I go back to that risk between if you look at what's going on out there at the moment, that's a big risk for manufacturers. You know, I think uh, Intel and I think all of us are working. How can we accelerate? What do we need to do? So, you know, that's to me is the biggest challenge. It's going to take time. You've got people that are involved in processes that are used to doing things for 30 or 40 years. People don't like change. <laughs> it's very difficult for them to comprehend. So we've got to work through the people challenges. We've got to work through the manufacturing challenges. We've got to work through the supply industry. But I believe everybody genuinely wants to do that. So, you know, I'm positive. I really think we're going to make a huge difference. It's something that I'm particularly passionate about, as people will know me and Intel. You know, um, the technology that we're trying to do to underpin this, I think, will really truly start to unleash some of these things. So, again, maybe a bit ranting, but to me, I'm very passionate about that subject. And I think the challenge is actually very good question. It is the difficult thing that we've got to work with over the next few years. Absolutely. Thanks for adding those comments. Um, Christopher White uh, has asked, uh, I think this question actually was for Stephen uh, Phipson, but uh, let's see if any of you uh, could respond. Do politicians and aspects of society have unrealistic expectation on how quickly certain sectors of manufacturing can decarbonize? Is the furor over the Cumbria uh, coal mine a good example of this? And uh, I apologize if I do not pronounce the name uh, correctly. <laughs> Shall we wait for Stephen to join? Sure. I mean, I think certainly from my side, I would say I, th I think that there is sometimes unrealistic expectations. And I think, but equally, I think it is something that I, I think it is a positive thing that there is so much focus on it. And I think it's positive. There is so much discussion. Um, I think if you don't have that, if you don't have it in the debate and in the conversation, then things don't tend to change. But I think there has to be a reality around how quickly some of those things can change. I do think we as a society, we do tend to think quite short term. And I think with politics, it's particularly short term. So I think you have to be very careful is that they will often be saying what they need to say for the next two or three year cycle. Um, I think the idea of um, us working on things that perhaps are going in the longer term of 10 or 20 years um, tends to be a little bit harder to do. And you can certainly see that even with a lot of the climate kind of agreements is that people are in and then they're out and it will change depending. But I think overall, the conversation around this is really important. I think the focus on it is um and i think that does keep people's minds focused on it but there does have to be a reality and i think this was something that, you know that people on the ricky mentioned is for a lot of the people that are necessarily are working on this it's not something that you can sustain to change overnight the idea of you can suddenly transform these businesses overnight or if we stopped all diesel or petrol cars suddenly there'd be enough electric cars for everybody to to do overnight it's i think the progress has to be measured and it does need to still be kept to account but I think there has to be a realism around the pace. And I think at the moment, the pace of change is, I'm sure Pete, some people would argue go quicker, but I would certainly say it is accelerating, which I think has to be a positive thing. Absolutely. I would agree. I, I, I just think it's agree. I, I think there's a balance. <laughs> Maybe smile at you as you were saying, yeah, policies think in, in, in election cycles, you know, uh, very often. But, you know, I think that, again, there's a genuine need and setting up those objectives and those expectations, pushing hard, I think is the right thing to do. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, you know, we've all seen globally what the impact of the environment is. So I think politicians are waking up to that very strongly these days. So, yeah, are they unrealistic? Uh, given that it's taken 30 or 40 years and we still are, uh, are running on very old technologies, yeah, I think... You know, the realism of it is going to take time, but the expectations can be out there. I think that's the right approach to push 
industry. But also, I mean, I see Stephen's coming back. I'm sure he's going to have some comments on here. But, you know, I, think, I also think it's important that governments can lay the, lay the foundation and make it easier. You know, how do you do that through taxation and through support of industry and things like that? You know, education. You know, I mean, that's important as well. You know, I think our younger generations are coming through with different expectations now. How you can make them more aware? They're the people that are coming into the manufacturing environments to the future as well. So I think it takes so many things to be done. Oh, we've lost Stephen again. Yeah, <laughs> I think maybe connection issues. <laughs> Just goes to show you, eh? So yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank, thank you, Ricky. I'd like to capture another question um, that I think is very important. Um, one of the audience has asked about uh, SMEs. Uh, the vast majority of manufacturers are SMEs. And it's very important to understand how these initiatives come across for SMEs, how the uh, government and policy makers are going to enable SMEs uh, to invest and move towards the net zero um, carbon emission. So does anyone have any uh, information from your own company's perspective, how you are working with the small, medium enterprises? I mean, I think from my side, I think those initiatives are important. I mean, I would broaden it out to say, um, I mean, it's something that we look at quite a lot with our customers is where you can get funding to do some of these projects. And I think there are two things for that. One is you can get funding that actually is going to help push you through for around sustainability anyway, which is a positive thing. But also in doing these kind of initiatives, you're also building your skill sets around the digital, you know, the digital technology and the digital skills too. So the benefit of this can be to drive you towards the you know, the net zero agenda, but you're also going to be working in areas that can have other value in your business too. Um, I certainly see there are a lot of our customers that don't leverage this enough. And also with, I would also extend it out to some of the technology partners as well, is that you shouldn't underestimate the value for people like us and for vendors like Microsoft, Cisco, all of these people make stuff, they make products, but what they need is the context and the value of how that can drive value within a business. So there is lots of funding available within those to work with SMEs because if you've got that partnership, it can make a real difference. And it's something I see. We're now working. I've got some customers that we used to sell technology to and that we're now partnering with to go to market with. So we're providing some of the technology services and we're supporting that. So we're investing in that and we're paying for that, but to help them go to market with something that is potentially greener or more efficient so helping them to build products more efficient so i think looking at how especially for smes there is a huge amount of value in what you do i think leveraging things like main smarter i think is positive there are other fundings there looking to do that but then looking at the suppliers you have and the people you work with to work with them in an innovative way there is definitely good opportunities to accelerate what you're doing in that space and um, just because you're an SME does not mean that you're not valuable to any number of the, the kind of the vendors and the suppliers in this space because of your domain knowledge and your experience. So it's um, really important. Well, thank you so much, Richard. I think we do have the similar type of approach with SMEs from Intel perspective. And uh, I see that Nahal is also nodding his head. And unfortunately, we have only two minutes left. Uh, there are uh, multiple questions still here. Uh, Stephen, we wanted to get you to answer a couple of those questions, but um, I think you had some connection issues. So maybe yeah, digital technology issues, probably. I think <laughs> we need more resiliency, I guess. Yeah. So, um, so I think we can get back to the audience and follow up on these questions um, to resilience first. Uh, and uh, with that, I would like to um, do a closing remark from Intel side that, um, around this event and how we think that industrial decarbonization is essential for addressing climate change. And at Intel, not only we stand committed to corporate responsibility and sustainability goals, but also we create 
and an open and a scalable technology that enable our, uh, enables our customers and ecosystem partners to reduce their environmental impact globally. So I would like to thank you very much, uh, all the audience who joined the event and um, our great speakers and uh, the panel members, uh, as well as Resilience First who hosted this event and uh, made uh, this event available to uh, the broader team. Thank you very much, Sahar, for, for chairing this. And, and this leaves me on behalf of Resilience First to thank everybody who's participated in this. Stephen, thank you so much. And apologies for the internet connection or whatever, or whatever cause it was, and that we weren't able to bring you in uh, to answer some of the questions. Um, but well, perhaps we can uh, go back to some people with some answers yeah. subsequently. Yeah. Um, thank you to Make UK, therefore. Thank you to the Institute for Engineering and Technology and to the Resilient Chip for, for supporting these webinars. We will be circulating a blog uh, of, of a summary of conversation in due course. Uh, so finally, just let me uh, close by saying that our next webinar is on the 23rd of March and we'll be looking at the aviation sector's approach to decarbonisation. So with that, thank you and have a good rest of the day. Goodbye. Thank you. Right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.